Really happy to have Dr. Tommy Wood on the uh, Performance People podcast, a neuroscientist, a performance coach, and in his own words, an elite professional nerd. But he is also the Associate Professor of Pediatrics and Neuroscience at the University of Washington. Better Brain Fitness podcast is his too, and he's also the Hints Ahead scientist for motorsports. So what this man doesn't know about better brain health, um, nobody does. Age-proofing our brain, Tommy. Um, how can we better do that? I think the the place to start is with a framework so that we kind of really get a handle of where we ourselves can make the biggest impact. Because what I might start to focus on to age-proof my brain is not the same necessarily as what you would do to age-proof your brain right now because we, we're doing different things. So the framework that I have, I call the 3S model. It's stimulus, supply, and support. So stimulus, um, something that you'll hear me talk a lot about is just how we use our brains, how the, the, the complex stimuli we're providing, and that's learning complex skills, it's interacting with other people, um, you know, it's doing uh, complex stuff out in the world and the way we interact with the world. That kind of starts this whole process of the brain um, essentially uh, undoing or preventing some of these aging processes. So when we stimulate the brain, we start to upregulate things like autophagy, and we turn off senescence and some of these things that people might have heard of, which are these processes, core processes of aging. Then if we want to respond to a stimulus, um, say where we may be, you know, there are some parts of the brain where we can be uh, building new neurons. Um, so like the main, the main cells that, that sort of connect in our brains or um, new blood vessels, that's also possible. Or maybe we're just uh, driving new connections through a process called neuroplasticity. Then we need a supply of nutrients and oxygen in order to achieve that. So uh, to get oxygen and blood to the parts of the brain that are active when we stimulate it, we need a healthy cardiovascular system that gets blood and oxygen to those parts of the brain. And then we need um, some kind of energy source for mm -hmm. most of the brain in most of us. That's glucose, though there are other options too, ketones, lactate, uh, for example. Um, and so we need a healthy metabolic system. That's where things like prediabetes, diabetes, um, metabolic syndrome, they increase the risk long-term of cognitive decline. Um, and then we need nutrients that form the parts of the cells in the brain. So we're talking omega-3 fatty acids, we're talking B vitamins, the importance of things like iron and vitamin D. We need just like the, those core nutrients to, to kind of make that happen. Then the final part is support. Um, and so this is where uh, we actually allow the brain to do its adapting. So this is where sleep is really critical. Um, but and in order for, for sleep to work and for us to, to sort of respond, right? Uh, if you think about when you're training as an athlete, you don't get stronger in the gym, you get stronger when you're recovering afterwards, right? And the brain is exactly the same. So then we need to try and mitigate uh, uh, chronic stress, if that's there, because that can prevent the brain from adapting. And then we want to try and avoid things that kind of prevent, again, prevent that process from happening, like too much alcohol, smoking, um, other sort of environmental toxins or, or exposures that can do that. So those are the three buckets, and they kind of interact and support one another. And then that gives us a place to say, well, oh, yeah, that's the thing that I'm probably not doing that's the, to sort of support my overall uh, age proofing in my brain. And that's, that's where I should dive in next. So the problem, I guess, in all of this is that if we're approaching midlife or we're in midlife, well and truly deep, dark in the rabbit hole that is midlife, um, then we've got all these other challenges going on. We've got really busy, manic lives. We've got lots of responsibility and lots of stress. Um, and so, you know, wanting to take all of what you've just said on board becomes an extra challenge, doesn't it? So how do we, how, what do you do on a daily basis that enhances or can enhance your own brain fitness? What can we do that you do? Because I feel you <laughs> so, know what to do. <laughs> so um, first of all, I, I don't often like to use myself as an example because I don't think any one person <laughs> as an example is necessarily an example for anybody else because what we get caught up, caught up in a ton is we see some other person and we see the stuff they do and they're like, those are the things that I should do. And in the process of trying to do that, we're doing two things. One, we're increasing stress because we're like, well, how am I going to do that? That just doesn't fit into my life. Um, and then we're also telling ourselves, hey, I'm not doing enough. And when we think we're not doing enough, that creates its own stress. You can actually measure it in your physiology. And 
seems to be associated with worse long-term okay, health Okay, but outcomes. now now I'm stressed thinking about <laughs> what it is that I should be doing instead of just replicating what you're doing. Yeah, so and I think this is the uh, this is one of the main issues of the the information and social media age, right? However you cut it, you can find a way to to increase your stress. So I think the most important thing is you know when we try and approach some aspect of behavior change, is that like maximum you focus on one or two things and you make it really small and you make it really easy, right? So of all the things that I mentioned, so say I, I mentioned uh, cardiovascular fitness and, and physical activity, and you're like, oh, man, like, I just like right now, I just can't, I can't. Um, but you hear me say sleep, and you're like, do you know what? Could I spend 10 minutes more in bed tonight? Could I go to bed 10 minutes earlier? Try and give myself 10 minutes more of sleep opportunities. You're like, yeah, I could probably do that. So that's where to start. So make like, it realistic. Make it realistic, one or two things max at a time. And if, and I know, right, you, you guys are big on sleep. And I know that there's, if you think I have to sleep at nine hours a night and I currently sleep six hours a night, you're like, what's, what's the point of trying to change sleep? Because I'm, I just can't hit nine hours because of my job and my kids and all this other stuff. Um, and so how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? So that's where... Just pick something that's super easy to do. Get in bed 10 minutes earlier. 10 minutes extra sleep opportunity. You might get four or five minutes extra sleep. And then, right, then two or three weeks' time, you're like, oh, that was pretty easy. Now I'll get in bed another 10 minutes earlier. And you slowly build up. So pick one thing, make it super easy, celebrate the wins. Like you've invested in yourself, like you've done something that's gonna long term support your brain health. And then as you know, things change or, or as you get a little bit more capacity, uh, maybe, maybe things improve, you're sleeping a little better, you have a little bit more mental energy to work on something else, then you bring in the next thing. One of the things that could make me feel much better about this conversation is actually if you debunked the myth that your brain goes downhill as you age, that would, <laughs> that would, that would de-stress me if I knew that that was the case. So I... So the, the thing is, when you say stuff like that, you activate the scientist in me. And I'm like, oh, I need to give 12 different caveats because like, <laughs> there's no absolutes. So the brain does not have to decline as much as it does in most people as we age. That's, that's the best I can give you because we can't prevent aging entirely. But there are, I mean, I, I can cite hundreds of studies on uh, resistance training, on brain training, on, um, uh, on sleep where if you improve um, a quality of just one of those things in people in midlife, uh, we, we could be talking um, you know, peri or postmenopausal women, we can be talking people in their like 90s doing high intensity resistance training. Um, we see significant, significant improvements first in the thing that we're trying to improve and then in cognitive function as well. I was going to say, like, how good is physical exercise for not just mental health, but actually for the brain? It's, you know, other than how, you know, how we use our brains, I think physical activity is probably the panacea of brain health, if, if we could have one, um, just across the full range. So we see improvements in cognitive function just by breaking up periods of being sedentary. Um, so if you're, if you're sedentary for a long period of time, a blood flow to the, to the uh, brain decreases motivation decreases, focus decreases, you get up and do like 15 body weight, like air squats, and you can offset a huge amount of that. And some of it is to do with increasing arousal again, because arousal is really important. But some of it's also just breaking up some of these detrimental effects of being sedentary. And actually, being sedentary is pro-aging rather than necessarily exercise being anti-aging, or well, there's a bit of both. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean that you can't sit a lot because our ancestors did and do it's just that that sitting is much more active or they're moving around occasionally right so it's not that i'm telling you you can't sit at all because that's not true either um but then you know walking the more steps you do the the lower the risk of dementia up to about sort of ten thousand ish steps a day and then you know the greater your cardiovascular fitness so you start to build in some just some like brisk walking three times a week for 40 minutes um is that, that was there was a trial that did that now uh, about 15 years ago 
that for the first time showed you could increase the size of the hippocampus in people in their 60s. Before then, we thought the brain only gets smaller over time and there's nothing we can do about it. Just a brisk walking intervention sort of reversed that decline in the size of the hippocampus, which is really important for memory. So and that's then, really exciting. The idea yeah. that we can actually, with, with age or as we get older, there is um, a... Uh, you know, food for thought over the idea that we might be able to enhance the brain's potential. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially, obviously, the gains are biggest in those who aren't doing those things previously, right? If you haven't done mm. much exercise before, literally any exercise you do now is going to be associated with improved cognitive function and lower de uh, dementia risk long term. Um, but then, you know, the same is the case for sleep and diet and all these other things. So if there's any of those areas where you're like, do you know what? I just haven't really spent a lot of time focusing on that. Even if we're now into our 50s, 60s, 70s, there's still time to make a difference. Okay, so I'm going to finish this section off by asking you um, this tricky question, which hopefully you'll surmise in the space of a sentence or two, um, which is fundamentally, what is the single most important thing that we can do to age-proof our brains? I think... The way, think about how we interact with the environment. And I, I say it that way because that allows me to bring a whole bunch of different things into play. So it's how we use our brains. It's how we're physically active. It's how we're socially active. But just remaining engaged in the world, doing human things, using our brains, moving our bodies, speaking with other people. Um, because when we start to lose that, that's when our cognitive decline uh, accelerates later in life. So engage with the outside world as much as you possibly can. How That's much damage, how much damage, Tommy, did COVID do for people in terms of brain health? Because you talk about engaging with the outside world. I mean, we had this period of like a couple of years where people were effectively forbidden from doing exactly that. You know, just having that daily interaction, that social buzz. I mean, how much damage did that do? Are we starting like another hour of the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got to answer this in approximately one minute. <laughs> um, the, the, the answer is, um, pr for, for some people, it seems to have done quite a lot of damage. But um, based on everything we've already talked about, I fully believe that damage is reversible and you can move beyond it. So we could focus on the fact that, yes, you know, there was a, a large experiment done in many different ways um, that negatively impacted brain health and mental health on a global scale. Um, but I would prefer to focus on the fact that right now, there's a ton of stuff we can do about it. Okay, that feels like a positive note to end on. Thanks, Tommy. Thank you.